Alrighty, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, just before we get started, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, we are recording this session. There are closed captions available and you can access them by clicking in your Zoom toolbar. Uh, at the end, we'll have a survey link posted in the chat. And uh, with that being said, I'll hand it over to our presenters so they can get started. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Hi, everyone. My name is Karan Martinez, and as we have people coming in, I am going to start my screen sharing. We're just delighted you're here at uh, one of the last sessions of, uh, of today's conference. So can you all see my screen? I'm gonna also say part of the fun of being part of a team is that if anybody would like to be commenting in the chat and um, having a kind of a side conversation, we would love that. And Isabel, Jason, or Seamus, feel free to comment away because I can't actually see the chat from my um, stance here as the driver of our, of our slides. So excellent. Um, it's been a great day. I'm reminded by attending all these Ann Farron sessions that the Ann Farron conference is really a conversation space that given the theme, given that it's AU as an entire university, it's just so exciting and reassuring to understand that all of us as teachers and as staff are actually just as much learners as our students are. And we're really learning from one another. Um, so like you, we were challenged by the theme this year about belonging and connection in an AI-centered um, world, in an age of AI. Uh, so we had a lot of discussions about where we wanted to kind of land and what we might uh, come up with. And we're very grateful. I want to give a shout out to the CTRL staff because we came back to them with a lot of questions and they gave us great feedback and forced us to dig deeper. So thank you, CTRL staff. Today, we're excited to share with you our presentation, Emotional Intelligence is an Evergreen Classroom Competency. Um, we feel that um, we don't have all the answers about um, development and human learning and, and the project we all get to be involved in uh, with our AU students. But um, so we don't know if generative AI is more a promise or a peril and probably both. Uh, as Betsy Cohn said in her session this morning, she came away with a large gathering at AAC and U at least to say, this is gonna be uh, an, a time of exploration and discovery. And so we're really glad that all of you uh, are on board with us. Um, you'll see that our main point today is that um, we know that we do value our very human abilities to reason, listen, compromise, and bond with one another, um, things that generative AI just can't do, at least not yet. Um, and we want to grow those very human abilities in our students uh, during their time at AU. This is a joint production of the Kogat School of Business and the School of Public Affairs. Thank you so much, Jason, our esteemed colleague, for joining us. Um, and let's meet the team. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Karan Martinez. I've been at AU now since 2008. I spent eight years as a professorial lecturer in CAS, in the Writing Studies Program, before coming over to Kogod seven years ago to direct the Center for Professionalism and Communications. Um, we are an academic support program fueled by peer tutors. Um, you'll see an ex-peer tutor and a current peer tutor right now uh, on our team. And uh, we work with our faculty partners to not only develop amazing business professionals among our students, but folks that will be able to communicate in written and oral fashion, give presentations, be amazing team members, and all the ways that they show up professionally at work as well. With that, I'll turn it over to Jason. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks, Karan, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Affairs, Department of Justice, Law, and Criminology. I'm an Eagle also. I graduated the Washington College of Law a number of years ago. 
Um, I'm happy to be here. Looking forward to discussing emotional intelligence with all of you and great to collaborate with you, Fran, as well, and Seamus. I'll pass it on. Hi, everyone. My name is Isabel, and I am the ex-peer consultant that Karan was referring to. Uh, currently, I am the coordinator for the Center for Professionalism and Communications at COGOD. A little bit about me, I got my undergrad degree in art history with a double minor in business administration and Spanish language, and then stayed on for an extra year to get my master's degree in art history, and I'm just super excited to be here. Thank you. Seamus. Hi, my name is Seamus Quinn. Uh, I'm in my third year at American University as a business admin major, as well as my third year as a peer consultant for the uh, Center for Professionalism and Communications. I'm really excited to be here today. And with that, let's continue with the learning. So the outcomes that we identified as wanting you all to, live, to leave with, and again, as part of this continuing conversation in these two days at Ann Farron, identify and discuss teachable emotional intelligence skills, right? Emotional intelligence is something that we acquire through our experience and, and our learning and our families and our culture, um, but what is teachable and how can we help students to grow in our classes and programs, not only in content knowledge, but in their own self-awareness, their ability to collaborate as well. We thought that with this conversation that we would have that we could then be thinking about adding to classroom activities that many of you may have in your syllabus or ones that you could add in um, that really privilege social learning, creativity, along with that intellectual need to, to acquire knowledge. Um, and that some of those might come across um, then as an alternative to running to AI, for instance, to brainstorm because of increased a sense of community and trust in peers and partners, that then those become the first choice, uh, especially for multi-part projects that can feel overwhelming and students may feel pressed for time. Uh, so those are a couple of the things and, and we'll see what else comes out of it. Um, so why does emotional intelligence as part of a liberal arts education in 2024 even matter? We propose that EI matters because EI fluency matters in the world, uh, in our students' lives and in their professional uh, choice of, of whatever sector they go into after AU. Um, and that being contributors overall to the civic project of well being and productivity and happiness is something that we should care about. Um, we found this study from uh, Ernst and Young um, saying that. Uh, the, uh, the, the study was, um, let me get my numbers right, um, more than 1,000 U.S. workers nationwide from all different sectors. Um, and empathy, understanding, the ability to listen were really highly prized by these employees that they, uh, that they interviewed. Um, and importantly, that not only was it important to feel that somebody had walked in their shoes or was going to be open to flexibility or problems they might have or their support. Um, but the business folks in my audience will love that the mutual empathy between company leaders and employees leads to measurable better outcomes, um, increased efficiency, uh, raise in revenue. So we like to talk at Coad about the, the double bottom line, right? What's good for business and what's good for people. And that is definitely uh, something that is possible when you have emotionally intelligent, intelligent people in the workplace. Um, but these findings about the importance of emotional intelligence and related soft skills, which we at the ProCom Center like to call power skills of business, are not just limited to the professional world. This is some information from NACE, and I know many of you in the audience are familiar with NACE, the National Association of Colleges and Employers. Uh, it's, it's a national uh, association that has colleges and universities in constant conversation with, employee, with employers. Are we teaching the things we need to be teaching? Uh, what kinds of skills are you needing? And we love this data point uh, because of that middle pillar at 2018, 2019 with the 73.3%, that's what percent of employers said that GPA mattered most in their screening and vetting and inviting of students to, to work for them. In five short years, 
Last pillar, 2022-23, only 37% of them are saying that. Instead, they're, they're citing the need for holistic measures. They're wanting to know and have students prove to them by virtue of clubs, extracurriculars, projects, service, how well they can listen to one another, how well they work in teams, how well they communicate. And so we just think that's exciting and a challenge for us to make sure that we are, we are integrating those skills every bit as much as our content knowledge in our classes with our students. I'm gonna turn it over now to Jason to define how we're talking about emotional intelligence today. Jason? Yeah, thanks, Karan. Um, so we'll be referencing uh, concepts from this chart here. It's from positivepsychology.com's article, quote, emotional intelligence charts, diagrams, and graphs. It's aptly titled. Um, if you look under the social competence and regulation uh, framework categories, and more specifically relationship management, so that bottom right-hand box, um, here it directly addresses empathy as, quote, using sensitivity to another person's feelings to manage interactions successfully. And empathy is one facet, an important facet, I would argue, to emotional intelligence. It's one part. But I also want to connect that back to this morning uh, during the plenary session. We heard from Dr. Ashley Prelo. Um, who discussed the need at AU for having a transformational experience for students. And, that, and she said, which requires, quote, time, empathy, and commitment to knowledge. So I think this thread of empathy he is going to come through uh, loud, uh, loud and clear here uh, in our presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So this is me just taking photos in my neighborhood uh, outside my apartment building in Northwest DC. I'm sure some of you have seen these signs up. Uh, they're scattered through the neighborhood. Um, this definitely reinforces uh, the slide that Quran had uh, about the Ernst and Young study and how important empathy is. It also connects back to the prior chart, uh, recognizing social awareness is, quote, caring what others are going through. And I think when I'm on the roads driving and I see this, I want to be a more empathetic driver, definitely want to be a more empathetic person, faculty member, and AU community member every time uh, I see that sign. Uh, so how can we be more empathetic in our roles in higher education? How can we increase our self and social awareness, uh, strengthen our relationships, and self-manage? Um, we hope that we can tackle some of these questions here today. So, uh, Karan, I think I hand it back to you. You do. One example of building our emotional intelligence in a business course that we teach at COGOD is our inclusion of storytelling for business which is an exercise adapted from the United Nations Story Circles exercise. Um, we wanna thank Christina Damian, who a few years ago, Christina, I don't know if you're here, I've seen you at some of the other sessions, did a presentation on your use of Story Circles with your grad students at SIS. And we loved the premise of building resilience through the development of intercultural competencies, such as listening and mutual understanding. I'm going to turn it over to Isabel in just a second because she's moderated and facilitated many of these circles in our um, course. Um, but it's a moment to remember that with COVID and the isolation of, of being with a computer screen and not with people, that we find even now that students have a high degree of, of anxiety about what to say to people they don't know, about how to start a conversation. Um, in previous sessions, they've talked about, we need to actually teach students time management. We need to actually teach students how to organize themselves. Um, we think we need to actually teach and have them practice this just conversational ability to listen and respond to people. And that's really what this exercise does so beautifully. So Isabel, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, your experience? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Karan. As she was saying, our Storytelling for Business workshop is really one that forces uh, students to open up and be a little bit vulnerable with each other and really start making connections. These story circles, as we often refer to them, really help to build from all four of the aspects that Jason mentioned, all four quadrants in that EI framework that he talked about. Thank you, Karan. And we specifically make it a point to highlight in social awareness, this idea of really hearing what the other person is saying. When we're running these workshops, we have two rounds, which I did the math totals to about 24 minutes, where 
one student will talk at a time and no one else in the group is allowed to either respond or react, the whole idea is just for them to really pay attention and understand what the other person is saying. So the main goal of storytelling for business is really to challenge these students to, again, active listen, but also relate back to one another and form those emotional bonds and emotional connections that Kron was talking about and how we often see for discussions of emotional intelligence. The phrase that I have underneath this picture of an example story circle is the I used to think and now I think. We use this statement in our debrief sessions after every workshop and in every single session that we have held, we often have a student or a few students who will say something like, I used to think I was different or couldn't really relate to my peers, but now I think maybe we're more similar than I thought. Students will often build these connections maybe on hobbies. We had students who bonded over sailing. Sometimes it will be a tough situation in a group project that they've encountered. encountered. Or simply, maybe I really like my hometown and you really like your hometown. Or sometimes it's maybe I really don't like my hometown and you don't like it either. So really these introductions to the key aspects of emotional intelligence between our co-god students and specifically the ones who participate in the 101 business professionalism course will help to set them up for their small group meeting simulations, which helps build upon the things that they've learned here and happens later in the semester. And we'll also, we will discuss it with Seamus a little bit later in this presentation. Thanks, Isabel. Yeah, next slide. So yeah, we're really, now we're gonna talk about this idea of emotional intelligence in peer-to-peer -peer discourse. We have this article here from the Eagle that was published last year, December, 2022. And the headline, it's time to re-examine the way we foster academic discourse among peers. Students are talking about and want to learn how to discuss and debate between each other. The article really talks about some confusion on the student's part about maybe what their role is, what the professor's role is, when do you step in? And our colleague Jason does stuff in his classes to actually model this and put more responsibility on the students in a more collaborative way to really build these ideas and how we discourse. So I'm gonna hand it off to Jason. Thanks, Isabel. So I'm gonna discuss classroom agreements that I've been using for a number of years. Um, obviously we live in a time that's uh, contentious domestically, globally, politically, and even within higher ed. Um, so I do make this effort at the beginning of the semester, usually in the first, very first class with students that instead of me mandating rules for uh, classroom engagement, uh, discussion, debate, and discourse, um, that we work on this uh, collective class agreement uh, together. Um, and it, I really do feel it enriches the emotional intelligence of every class member. When I say that, I mean instructor, teaching assistant, program leader, peer facilitator, and obviously the students as well. So these are just some of the questions uh, that can help in discussing the parameters of this agreement, which I mentioned in the first class prior to actually creating it um, because uh, first and foremost, respect means different things to different people. And I tell them that my, my version of what I think is respect in terms of not having personal space afforded, uh, cursing, limiting interruptions, which are overt behavior as well as subtle but equally damaging behavior like microaggressions that try to get those incorporated in the class agreement, but largely the class agreements created by the students and not by me. And we go through, have a dialogue to get it established. And I said, if we need to update it, uh, that we can. Um, we also look to try to distinguish intent from impact, which can help to mitigate or, or possibly defuse a hot moment. Um, we look to dis distinguish fact from, from opinion when we're doing this agreement. And we do encourage students to think beyond dichotomies. So it's great to have this class agreement, but how is it actually enforced? I think that needs to be discussed as well. Uh, to, to have it on paper or hopefully posted Canvas, ideally. Um, so I said, we recommend giving a student a warning. I either will pull them aside or um, the class can, and we'll refer back to the class agreement. Um, if it's happening a lot, you can definitely an individual meeting uh, with a student is necessary. If the conduct continues, I, I, the instructor would have the discretion to move the class ex exercise. Uh, and again, uh, try to find a way to keep class going. And obviously if it's an extremely hot moment, that's causing huge disruption sometimes in extreme cases, uh, class will have to be, uh, ended. Can we go to the next slide, please? 
Um, so you may uh, consider having some type of emotional intelligence statement or language about EI. Um, this statement would be uh, discussed prior to creating the class agreement. And again, the key is to foster uh, learning in a healthy classroom environment while reinforcing the ideas of EI. Um, so these are just some sample statements that I, I've kind of come up with. Feel free to share them widely or, or you can hopefully cater maybe some of your own ideas into your syllabus. But the two I'm gonna focus on here are, if any class, maker, class member makes one assumption, have it be that we are all committed to enriching our learning about and whatever your subject matter is. And also relatedly, we all come from different backgrounds and fostering healthy classroom debate, discussion and discourse are essential to education. So I just think of, uh, in ways of, of incorporating this uh, into our uh, syllabus or um, maybe a separate handout or something. It's just something to think about as we move forward. Um, so uh, next slide, I think we're gonna be moving into our uh, breakout activity here. So I'm just gonna introduce it. I think we'll take five to seven minutes in uh, randomized breakout groups discussing the following. How are you thinking about including emotional intelligence or relationship management in your courses? Um, and secondly, what are you doing to foster peer-to-peer -peer connections in the classroom? So let's take, uh, take some time for these breakout rooms and we'll uh, signal to you when uh, the time is up. How many breakout rooms would you all like? I think Isabel- Yeah, I just that. started them. Okay. I just... Thanks everybody. We'll see you back here about five to seven minutes. Isabel, is there a way to put the two All right, welcome back everybody. Um, does it look like all, everyone is back? I'll keep going. We wanted to give you another example of an activity, uh, again, from our business professionalism course um, that provides EI practice in a work scenario. Um, and so what we do is we create a meeting simulation. And this last fall, we piloted a new topic for a meeting simulation geared to students thinking about their um, civic responsibility as well as business roles around Facebook, AI, and the 2024 upcoming election. And so students were put into groups over a period of a couple of weeks to work together to research different roles at Facebook that could realistically be putting together a company-wide worldwide plan for Facebook meta um, to advise Mark Zuckerberg to be called to Congress and testify about steps that Meta would take to ward off disinformation and other malicious mischief in the upcoming election. Um, and to talk about it with us a little bit and, and what he learned um, is Seamus, who was in that class and um, is going to have a little bit of a back and forth with Isabel. Awesome. Yeah. To start off, thank you, Seamus, so much for making the time to be here today. As you said, you're still not even back to D.C. yet because it's not quite the start of the semester. So really taking the time to be here. And yeah, we always love to hear from students at the end of the day. They're the whole reason why we're here and why we do what we do. So it's always good to hear their point of view. I'm going to start off with a super easy question for you. Uh, what do you feel like were your initial takeaways from this exercise? So for me, I think there were two things that I want to highlight. First being the added value in having these group work projects be in person rather than recorded and uploaded on Zoom. Um, I think that a lot of the times in my courses in COGOD, we have final projects that are meant to be completed in a group. However, the only aspect of it that is a group project is that you need other people on your submission. There isn't really often opportunities to actually collaborate with your group members and work alongside them. Rather, 
you split the project up into multiple pieces. Each person completes their own piece independently, and then you come together to record and upload a final project. I think that this uh, simulation allowed me to do something a little more than that, where I actually worked with my peers in a real time. It wasn't something we split up. And secondly, um, the fact that I went in not knowing what my group members would bring, even though we're part of a group project, was something I noted. It was a little nerve wracking at first because in my experience, for the most part, you work together to create the projects and you know what they're gonna say. So it was a little off-putting at first to see them talk about subjects without me having looked over it beforehand, like seeing this for the first time. But I do think it was valuable in that in the real world, you don't always get to see what everyone's gonna present before you get to the presentation. Exactly, yeah, we love on the fly thinking and really coming up with stuff on the spot. That's a great example. All right, my next question for you is, what do you feel like was particularly easy about this exercise? Maybe what was a little bit difficult about this exercise? Can you speak to that? So I think that I'll, I'll start with what was most difficult. And for me, that was that first moment when we finished having each team member present their individual recommendations. And we transitioned to an unstructured environment where we had to come to a group consensus as to which of our individual ideas we would bring um, to Zuckerberg. And in that moment, I was initially unsure how to act. I hadn't been placed in this situation before. In the majority of classrooms and in general, just intellectual areas where students have the opportunity to present their ideas, it's a lot more structured in that you know to respond when the teacher asks a question. Um, you know it's your turn to talk when the teacher calls on you after you raise your hand, rather than just having it be student-led where there is no one to tell you when you're supposed to talk. No one's there to tell you when to raise your hand, when to listen, when to contribute. And I think that it really forces you to become aware of yourself in the presence of your peers and to be aware of, okay, what can I do to help us come to this consensus? And what can I do to help my teammates come to this consensus? And for me, that came in using one of my Clifton strengths, which was Includer. And I started off by asking a bunch of questions to my teammates, asking them, hey, what do you think the best recommendations are? And after a few minutes, I would then go, okay, so out of the ones we've narrowed it down to, which one is, do you think should be removed and why? Something like that. And for me, it was really valuable to see myself act and see how I would act in that situation. Um, and I think that it's helpful going forward, I can go into these unstructured conversations like such as business meetings, knowing, okay, I'm aware that I'm someone who likes to get the conversation going and bring other people and ensure that everybody has a chance to say their piece so that we have the best chance of use, utilizing all of our available resources. Yeah, I love that idea of it being an unstructured kind of collaborative environment, really forcing you to be more self-aware and self-reflect and how important those aspects are to emotional intelligence. All right, thank you so much, Seamus. Now I'm gonna toss it back to Karan. She's gonna talk a little bit about emotional intelligence and AI. Karan is having trouble advancing the slides. Um, Oh, now they went too far. Hold on. This is acting a little funky. Boy, this is not my day with Google Slides. Um, sorry, everybody. Let me see if I can troubleshoot a little bit. Um, Would you like me to try? Hold on, we've got this really good slide. That brings us back. <laughs> Google Slides don't have emotional intelligence. 
<laughs> Thank you, Jeff Middens. <laughs> I love that. Um, yes. So bringing it go. back to generative AI, here we go. So no doubt that AI is really compelling. And we've heard that from some of the students um, that I've talked about um, the efficiency and the productivity. I was blown away in Allison Thomas's discussion about Grammarly, about their representative, Zach, who makes videos saying, students, you can, you know, brainstorm an entire project and make a research plan in a minute and a half. And, and we hear that from some of our Kogan students, right? That, but I can create a marketing plan in 90 seconds. Um, so no doubt, those are compelling reasons when you need to be efficient or productive, or you need to summarize a large amount of data. Uh, but it's about not just turning all of our heart, souls, and minds over to the machines, right? Remembering that the work of an academic community is to learn, not just produce. Um, I was compelled by, uh, what was his name? Josh Elliott uh, in Betsy Cohn's session earlier, who said, struggle is kind of how I learn. You know, if I'm not struggling to see what I put into words and what I'm lacking, I'm not really learning. I'm just kind of aggregating information. And I want to bring Seamus back in then as our current student to say, but how can we argue with students against being efficient, efficient and productive, right? Your time is short. Um, yeah, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, thank you for that, Karan. And so at least in my experience, you know, a lot of AU students have a job on top of going to school, plus they're involved in some kind of athletics club or whatever, whatever kind of club. But that, that is to say, students aren't just one tracked beings who come to class, go home, do their homework, and then come to class the next day. A lot of us have lives outside of school. And it's hard to convince students that class isn't about being efficient and productive. And especially when, in my experience, a lot of classes have major projects or assignments associated with them that have a final due date around the end of the semester. And that's it. That's all the work that goes into that final project. And of course, during the semester, there'll be small deliverables. But, you know, the main meat of the topic is confined in this project that you turn in and it's just one click. You submit it and it's done. It's hard not to view that as transactional. I think that it's easier for students to put the proper thought into individual aspects of assignments um, in order to get the most out of them when it's split up into different pieces. For example, in Marketing 300, a course I took at COGOD, I believe last year, um, we had a final paper that was generally comprehensive about the course concepts and allowed us to express what we've learned by analyzing an industry and a market sector. But what made this project different is that rather than one final submission, throughout the semester, we had to submit each part and then we're given the opportunity to work with our peers and review each part post-submission. Um, I think that for me, this made it a lot easier to dive into the necessary depth into each of the different subjects that were presented in the paper. For example, the first part was about the broad industry analysis. And had that been only one of four parts for a paper that I submitted on May 5th, I might not have had the time or the motivation to take away time from other activities and other things I'm doing in my life and put it into one part of this project. Whereas when it's, even though it's still part of the same project, when I have to focus on it at a different juncture in the semester, it gives me the freedom and the comfortability knowing that, okay, if I spend a lot of time on this, I don't have to worry about the rest of the assignment right now. And I think that that really help students put all their effort into each part and actually learn rather than just viewing the submission as uh, I give you this and I get an A. You're actually breaking it down and learning. Right, and, and you're learning to trust each other for the advice you give each other the, and the peer review. You make a friend, you know, you have a collaborator in the class, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we, for one of our parts, the middle submission, we did that. We partnered with one of our classmates and went over each of our submissions and gave each other feedback, used each other to help brainstorm ways we can improve our own papers. And I think that was really helpful in visualizing the project as not just a way for me to get a grade, but as a part of something bigger. Right. Seamus, that is such wonderful insights and we're so happy to hear them uh, because we're, we as instructors are often up against time, right? We've got to cover a certain amount of things in a short semester but to allow time for these processes to unfold. In the end, um, and I'm, I'm going to reference um, Josh Elliott again, who said um, there's a lot of struggle for him. He was the student in Betsy Cohn's um, session this morning. A lot of struggle for him in writing. He said, but it's that old saying, and he quoted this quote, I can't figure out what I think until I see it, until I write it. And it's just going to a prompt and engineering something and having it spit it out for me. I feel like I'm shortchanging myself. And so that in the end, I want to allow time for questions. I don't know if we'll have time for a second breakout, but at least all of us together in the room. And I see there's some comments in the chat. Um, leads to our central thesis about in all these ways, we want to give students other options for support in producing their academic work. Options that rely on one another, um, such as Seamus was talking about the verbal peer feedback or exercises where they have to reach consensus and they have to include voices that aren't uh, being heard around a table. Um, um, and one, can I say one other thing sure, with that? Please, please, please. I think that um, another way is through having more verbal discussions. It doesn't even necessarily have to be as formal as here, sit down and come to a consensus just more activities rather than having students submit discussion board posts that are very easy to use these other resources to fulfill them and get a product that's of similar quality to say if I spent 30 minutes brainstorming. Whereas if more activities involved actual verbal communication and having students talk about their ideas and discuss them with their peers, it's a lot easier to ensure that they're actually learning these things than when they say they are and submitting them in a weekly assignment that is typed. Right, and up against time, it's easy to, to fall into that. Um, for sure, my, my friend Allison Thomas, who many of you know, talks often about how students reference using AI as a shortcut. It's just, it's just easier, it's faster or as a substitution for going to the office hours of their professor or asking a friend. So by building these strong relationships, um, increasing students' emotional intelligence, it just gives them that, that very human resource to turn to. And, and that's really the, um, the, the, uh, the takeaway from our session. So um, we do have some resources. Um, in addition, anybody interested in Knowing more about the meeting simulation assignment, which uh, which Seamus talked about, it is a student-led activity. Uh, there's a facilitator around the edge of the room that's just assessing, but it's very student-run, and I'm happy to share that assignment prompt and, and the Padlet that we put together. Um, some of you teach in political science, maybe, or an SBA who might want to be interrogating Facebook and AI and the future election. It, it might be very transferable. Um, and I think at this point, let me stop sharing. We just have a few minutes left. There's some comments in the chat, but maybe just let's all talk together a little bit about any takeaways that all of you might have um, or questions that we can answer. Um, let's see. Yeah, Betsy, thanks for the shout out to Josh. For sure. He was uh, definitely thinking about what he wanted to get out of his college education and, and what was going to be in some ways maybe hijacked by um, a reliance. Um, so yeah, Betsy, thinking about if, if time is tight, teach less, right? Not assign so much, but privilege that mad soup of building emotional intelligence, of, of listening practice uh, and things like that. Jason, Isabel, Seamus, anything else you wanted to 
um, to add. Uh, looks like Jeff and she and Seamus are talking about that assignment. Yeah, yeah. I just quickly replied to uh, Jeff to say that I, what I was referencing is more along the lines of a scaffolded assignment, wherein each part isn't necessarily a separate submission. Even mm -hmm. if you do submit them at different times, each part should, at the end, become a cohesive final product. It should. Uh, like I wasn't trying to say make four smaller assignments rather the big assignment just have it be split into parts if that makes sense does that answer your question jeff uh sort of yeah. <laughs> I, I, I and we I can just... share the assignment with you too you can kind of get more of a view of it yeah i think it it's it, it they're they're it, it... I think I need to think of the whole, the whole thing together and they're, they're, yeah. I don't think we have enough time for that, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think importantly, since we um, support that assignment um, and, and, and also comment in writing on some of the students' work at each stage, it's really about thinking, well, I need to revise this. Should I just feed it all into ChatGPT or should I discuss it with a human tutor? who can interrogate me a little bit about where are my research points coming from? What is the best source to convince this audience? And so this more of a conversation and more of a learning that becomes possible in a smaller uh, chunks of assignment over time than, oh, I've got this 30 page paper to write, you know, for the last week of school kind of thing. Yeah, any other questions or comments that we can we can answer? Thanks, Jeff. And I'm happy to share that that assignment with you. Um all right. Uh Victoria, do we need to do anything? Yes, there's the survey. Um, please reach out to us. Um I'm gonna put back as you're on your way out the door the slide that had the team members on it if, so that if you want to get in touch with us um, with our email addresses, please feel free. Oh, this, forget it. I'm I'm being permanently challenged by, by Gmail. Um, I mean, by Google Slides. But um, yeah, Jason, anything else that you wanted to say, Mike? No, th thank you everybody for attending. I know this is the last session of the day and people are probably Zoomed out and uh, thanks for having your empathy and joining us uh, today. So, and thanks for on as well and Seamus. We appreciate you all have a great semester. We're happy to talk about any of the information from today. Thanks so much. Thank you everybody.